a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. You might remember that earlier this year, back in February, it doesn't seem all that long ago, does it? The Queensland state government released their draft anti-discrimination bill. Now, of course, there's federal bills and there's debate going on. Well, this one confined to a state. This is a state one we're going to be talking about today, but it might have all sorts of ramifications for wherever you're listening right around Australia. If passed, this legislation in Queensland is predicted to be the most repressive regime in Australia for restricting religious freedom. Our special guest today reminds us that on Tuesday this week, the Courier-Mail in Queensland reported that the Miles government have dismissed the concerns raised by church leaders and are planning to introduce the legislation before the October state election. Well, our special guest today says it is likely to dramatically undermine the ability of faith organisations to employ people who uphold their faith ethos. Mike Southon is Executive Director of Freedom for Faith, activating the church to defend religious freedom. Mike, a special welcome back to 2020. Thanks, Neil. It's great to be with you. Mike, let me just start with something that, uh, for listeners everywhere, right around Australia, um, but particularly now we're talking about the state of Queensland. Some people can't believe that this could be even happening in Queensland. Uh, Encourage us here. What's the evidence? Uh, How do you see things? I mean, I, I, I agree. I'm surprised that Queensland, this is something you'd expect to see in Victoria, Uh, perhaps, uh, or a far more progressive place like um, ACT. But for the Queensland government to go down this direction is quite extraordinary. Uh, In fact, it's it's far more restrictive legislation than Dan Andrews brought in uh, in Victoria. So, yeah, um, you asked for encouragement. Well, the encouragement is that we, I think we can stop this and we can engage um, well with our government and convince them to do otherwise. But right now, yeah, it's a shocking bill. Uh, talk a uh, ideologically driven politics here because uh, yeah. this is interesting because you know uh, of course Stephen Miles in, he uh, really um, inherited what you might call as a bit of a poison chalice perhaps from his predecessor uh, Palaszczuk and now seems to be working very hard to push through a whole lot of ideologically driven uh, legislation before he may well lose power. Is there something of a rush on? Do you think? It does feel like that, doesn't it? Uh, we, when, If I was the government and I was looking at the polls as they were standing, I would be thinking maybe I need to be a little bit more cautious. There are a lot of electorates on very small margins that they're walking into, uh, an election that the polls don't look good for them. But they do appear to be trying to rush through legislation, maybe in the hope that whoever's the next government won't repeal it. Uh, but it, it does seem like an odd thing to be doing just leading up to an election. It it's, seems to me like a good way of losing an election, to be honest. I mentioned uh, there's this thought that somehow or other anti-discrimination legislation and what happens around religious freedom is something that's happening at a federal level, and there is that debate yes. going on there. Uh, but the Miles government wanting to push this through before the next state election in October in the state of Queensland... What, in your understanding, how do you put this in a nutshell, uh, ought we be concerned about in this legislation? Look, the legislation has got, um, it it restricts the ability of faith organisations to choose to employ people who believe and live out their faith. Uh, And it does it across the board. Now, there's always been arguments in discrimination legislation between faith and gender and sexuality and who can discriminate against who. But this legislation says that you can discriminate when employing in a faith-based organization just on faith, only in very limited circumstances. And even then, if you've chosen to employ somebody in uh, in a job that you say it requires to them to have faith and you've chosen somebody based on their faith, even then the courts could decide that what you did was unreasonable. So it's it's asking for a world of pain and a world of of 
um, lawsuits for faith-based organisations. And at the moment, I guess where people have uh, difficulty with this or where there's grey areas, uh, some people will say, what about the school cleaner? Uh, does it matter that they have yeah. got uh, a Christian faith? Uh, what do you say for people who are sort of saying, uh, you know, let's just water this all down and let's just throw open the doors here for uh, this sort of legislation to affect schools and then ultimately charities and uh, potentially then churches? But, um, you know, what about the person who's like the cleaner? Do they have to have faith to be working in a Christian school? Well, it depends on the school. There are some schools that uh, have got a very strong identity that every staff member is a believer uh, for Christian schools who want everyone um, to have a living faith in Jesus Christ because that creates the community. A school is not just a place where you learn maths and English. It's a place where you form who you are. And every staff member in a school has got an impact on that. I was just hearing the other day about somebody and the experience they had um, and the encouragement they got from the groundskeeper at their Christian school and how that was actually one of the biggest triggers in their Christian life. So those schools need to be able to say, we are a community of faith. Everybody holds to this faith. There are other schools who want to be able to say, well, we can't actually employ every single person to, who had to have the same faith. We're a big school. It's hard to find people, but we do want to keep a critical mass we do want to have a majority of people in our school having a living faith, or we do want to make sure that at least 30, 40 percent do. It's up to the school and how they build their community, but they need that ability to choose to do that, to keep their faith identity. Let me take you back to the media reporting, and uh, you mentioned things like Tuesday this week, the Courier-Mail reporting that the <laughs> Queensland government, the Miles government, have dismissed the concerns raised by church leaders and are planning to introduce this legislation before the state election. This dismissiveness of the churches here, this is something that seems to be a pattern. How do you reflect on that? Yeah, I mean, the, first of all, it's really important to note this faith leaders letter was signed by 18 of the leading faith leaders. So we're talking... Anglican archbishops, Catholic archbishops, Muslims, Jewish, Uniting Church, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, Salvation, you name it. These are the faith groups who signed on to this one letter, all agreeing there is a big problem with this legislation. So it's not a small letter. And the government's response was frankly dismissive. Uh, Stephen Miles' quote is, he appreciates the effort. Uh, Grace Grace, who's the uh, minister responsible for that, said that, you know, I guess there were some specific issues that faith-based leaders have taken an issue with, but they're going to go on with the legislation. They're not going to pay attention to us. And it does go back to uh, the times where an archbishop could go and meet with a premier and explain that we have a problem and that this church has got a problem and get listened to, those times are gone. And politicians don't actually believe that when faith leaders speak, that the people of their faith are actually agreeing. And this is, this is because we, as Christians, have not been actively talking to our own politicians ourselves. We leave our leaders to do all the work. Uh, and so this is one of the most important things that we need to talk about. You and me, all of us, need to be going out and telling our MPs, oh, no, I'm worried about this too. It's not just my archbishop. It's not just my moderator. I'm worried about this. So listening to our conversation today, if you're someone yep. who's not taken even the simplest steps of action, uh, then you might be part of the problem because uh, we might all be personally held responsible for the way we're losing our religious freedoms right now. And uh, losing religious freedoms means major ramifications for the whole nation. Hey, just reflecting on uh, some of this pattern because uh, cast our eyes to federal legislation mm. that's being talked about and uh, the Australian Law Reform Commission that actually received submissions from everyone, including church leaders. Uh, this is the same complaint here that church leaders were completely ignored uh, because when their recommendations came out, it was obviously apparent that church leaders were not listened to when they made submissions. So is there something wrong with our submission process? Uh, what are your thoughts here? 
Uh, submissions go to a bureaucracy and the bureaucracy just doesn't care about what we're worried about. Um, in the end, the bureaucracy don't have to win elections. Uh, the whole legal process of getting submissions in and debating, it's a very important process. But in the end, it's our politicians who make decisions, not our bureaucrats. And it's our politicians who need to be persuaded. And in Australia, the reality is our politicians don't have good polling. They don't have good information. The only way they know what we care about is when we take the effort to tell them. And the federal issue is actually a really good example because over the past few years, we have been completely ignored. But over the past 12 months, we've been doing a lot of work to try and help grassroots church members, grassroots Christians to talk to their MPs, to contact their MPs. And so recently, a faith leader's letter at the federal level was sent to the Prime Minister, and it actually got results. It's a combination of our faith leaders being able to speak, but our politicians knowing that the grassroots, we're behind you, we're behind these faith leaders, and we agree with what they're saying. And so there is a turning in the pattern and a change in the pattern, and we're just, I believe, at the cusp of churches being able to be taken seriously by politicians once again. Government have dismissed the concerns raised by church leaders around this legislation, anti-discrimination legislation, likely to produce a very radical way of coming down hard on religious freedoms. So 1-800-316-316. I want to ask you, before we take any calls, um, does the church still have teeth? Does the church still have power? Because if we're being ignored, clearly our political leaders don't think that the church has teeth and power. What are your thoughts here, Mike? I think political leaders um, believe that the church as a thing with an archbishop or a moderator sitting on top doesn't necessarily speak for its members. And so our our politicians don't think that when uh, the church speaks that it's actually representing voters. But the simple reality is Christians have teeth and Christians have got political power because there are a lot of us and we are everywhere. And more importantly, we are in, in fairly high densities usually, some of the most marginal seats in every uh, electorate in Australia. Okay, there's power and it's the believers. It's you and I who have the teeth, not necessarily the archbishops wearing the hats and the robes. Uh, We are the ones who've got some power here and if we don't exercise that power, we may be losing these important freedoms. Hey, 1-800-316-316 to join our conversation. Let's take some calls. Shelby is in Brisbane. Hey, Shelby, haven't heard from you for a little while. Welcome along. Hello, Neil. Mate, um... Yeah, I love the show, but I just don't get enough time to listen to it. But today I've rang, and mean, mainly because I don't know if I'm on the right track here because I didn't, I hadn't had, I've had the station on, but I haven't been close enough to hear it all. Uh, I have it on twenty four seven. But anyway, the thing is, I'm hearing about this. Um, goodness me, the Catholic Church um, is saying that it's okay to have same sex uh, attraction, but it's not okay. To um, have uh, to have sexual acts, and I don't know how you uh, you know mix those two together and, and try and say that we're not having sexual acts. Um, it just it just blows my mind. I don't know if that was on the same topic as what you guys were on, um, but anyway, that's I heard it on the news, and um, just by the way, it was on the uh, other news, not you, not yours. But they <laughs> told me that you. You, you know, Shelby, you, you are you are onto an issue which becomes part of uh, the foundation for why all of this change is taking place and anti-discrimination legislation trying to bring balance because of the changes to the marriage definition and issues around sexuality and gender. So you you are on the right track here. This is something that's driving this. But let's get a thought from Mike. Mike, what are your thoughts here for Shelby? Oh, well, I'm not a Catholic. So I'm going to be very careful not to talk about uh, Catholic theology. Uh, But I I do think it is important to be able to say, I know I've got good friends who are faithful Christians who feel unwanted feelings about attraction to other people, whether it's a married man feeling an unwanted attraction to to the young woman walking down the road, or it's somebody feeling an attraction to someone of the same sex. Uh, it just because just we feel an attraction doesn't mean we have to act on it. I think that's one of the most important um, teachings and ethics 
from the gospel is that our world is broken and we are broken and we are sinful uh, and, and Jesus is the one saving us from that brokenness. But just because we have a desire doesn't mean we have to act on it. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I haven't looked at the Catholic teaching that you're talking about in detail, but I would like to say to anyone, just because you feel something doesn't make you automatically a bad person, it, we learn not to act on our evil thoughts as they come through. Okay, and uh, so let's just settle on uh, feelings are not the problem. It's the outworking of what uh, happens out of the feelings that we might say is the sinfulness. So, Shelby, thank you so much for your call. 1-800-316-316. As we talk about religious freedom, uh, it's where the rubber hits the road. What's happening in the state of Queensland? Let's take another call. Warren is in Broken Hill in New South Wales. Hey, Warren, welcome. G'day, yes. Um, I want to contribute to that uh, about freedom of Christianity. Um, I've worked with uh, Mel Garvin, Fusion Breakthrough Generation, mm. in the high schools and uh, going in there and supplying them with um, pancakes and all that sort of stuff and counselling and that. We used to do it regularly and um, all that seems to be put on pressure now you know you just don't get the freedom that you used to be able to get and I found it really hard because um, yeah it just made it really really difficult I think uh, talking about freedoms and that I think um, Dennis Prager that's got um, one billion followers on YouTube and most of them under the age of 35 and wrote a number of books and uh He's been to over 130 countries in the world. He generally puts a good word over for this too. Yeah. You know, Warren, you're freedom. making some good points here. Let's hear from our guest uh, because uh, this starts at the top, doesn't it? Uh, as legislation is passed, this filters through and those freedoms begin to disintegrate or evaporate. Uh, thoughts here from you, Mike? Yeah, well, Warren... Good on you for the work in the high schools too. Um, in, in a previous role, I spent um, five years working with um, high school SRE and chaplaincy uh, and I connected with Fusion. Uh, and so great work that you're doing there, mate. Um, but it is true. Uh, as the government start thinking that religion is a threat rather than a, a, a valuable resource for our community, they slowly shut us down. And we have seen that attempted in schools you know, our school's policy, our federal school's policy says that um, our spiritual development is an important aspect of our education. But in most states, uh, th they try and cut faith out. How are you going to have your spiritual development and then um, say, no, but we're going to cut faith out of the classroom? Uh, it, it's a great thing that New South Wales still has school scripture and chaplaincy and um, good work, Warren. But... That is because of a long-term process of churches and individual Christians engaging with both sides of politics in New South Wales, saying, we are here, first of all, we vote, and there's lots of us, but also we can contribute to society. We're a valuable resource to society. I think, um, I hate to say this to Queenslanders, but I think New South Wales is actually a great example of how we can show that we are both effective and um, and can impact elections and get our politicians to listen to us. Plenty to talk about, but let's, uh, Mike, let's take another call from a listener. Matthew is waiting patiently in Brisbane. Hey, Matthew, welcome. G'day, guys. How are you? Very well. What are your thoughts, Matthew? I'm going to try and condense what is a large point as small as I can for you. The one thing that frustrates me within with Christians is they don't get involved in politics. They sit back on their hands and they sort of go, well, you know, look, we don't want to create a stir and they, it's the old, you know, meek and mild and, you know, you know the, the, the don't judge and the don't do this and the don't do that. They forget that Jesus went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. I mean, these guys were the relig well, religious, but essentially the political, uh, the political guys of the day. And the problem is, when you stay silent, you nothing gets done. And I think if you look at the United States, where they they took prayer and Bible reading out of schools, then they you know, they 
it got limited in many, many you know, as much as they can to try doing it here. Then they've outlawed discipline in schools. They've outlawed discipline at home. So they've taken away basic fundamental Christian um, values. And now what we've got are generations of juvenile delinquents who are completely lost, suffering from severe depression and anxiety and a whole range of mental illnesses because those boundaries have been removed. And what Christians, and I speak to myself here, I know I'm, you know, I'm very quick. If something affects me, I'm straight on the, on the keyboard with a letter to my local member. But we need to start writing to our local members and the parliaments and the politicians and go, look, this is not acceptable because we are seeing this destroy our communities. We're seeing this destroy our way of life. Matthew, and you're I making some really good points here and let's get a thought or two from our guest Mike Southon from Freedom for Faith. Uh, Mike, what are your thoughts as you hear Matthew reflecting here? Matthew, you couldn't be more right. Uh, and this is something which I've been passionate about for well over a decade now. But Christians, we walked out of the political space one way or another. Uh, we left both political parties. We've left political engagement uh, over the past 20, 30 years. And now we turn around and look and say, why doesn't anyone listen to us anymore? Uh, it's we do. You're absolutely right. We need to get back into engaging in the political space, not not being partisan by saying there's only one Christian party that people could vote for or anything like that, but knowing how to wisely but effectively engage in politics, speak to our politicians, make a difference in this space. Uh, I mean, the first thing I'd be saying to you, you know, with your passion, join a party, any party. Uh, it's a great thing to be doing to actually get your voice inside a political party. But every one of us can, as Matthew has done, write to your MP. I said before that um, politicians don't have good polling. They don't know what we care about until we tell them. And the most effective way of telling them is having dozens of people in their electorate writing a short personal letter saying, I'm really worried about this. What are you going to do about this? This makes them sit up. This makes all the difference. Uh, Matthew in Brisbane, anything further to add? Yeah, if I can, yeah. Well, what people don't realise with, and especially in Australian law, if you send a letter to your, you know, your local member, I do believe that it's actually, they are required by law to respond. Now, the, the other biggest problem I, I hear from people is, you know, they say, oh, yeah, I wrote to him and, I, you know, I said, you expletive this and you expletive that and blah, blah, blah. And I sit there and I go, yeah, I wouldn't have got past the first line before I deleted it. And so yeah. they've got to learn how to engage. Uh, they've got to learn how to engage with politicians because when you go to them respectfully, and I know of a guy who got his, his divorce case before the head of the Federal Court of Australia, just by the letters he wrote to the politicians. Uh, so, Matthew, you're making some good points here, and courtesy is going to be one of those uh, issues, uh, the way you diplomatically engage with your local politicians. Uh, come back to Mike here for a moment. Mike, your thoughts on that point? Uh, we've created a website designed to help you write letters to your MP about these issues. It's called contactyourmp.org.au. And it is a simple guide to writing uh, to your MP currently focused on New South Wales and Queensland issues. You can look your MP up, find out who they are, find the contact details, get a simple guide to writing to them, including some key talking points on religious freedom issues. But it, you're absolutely right, Matthew. We don't, we've forgotten how to write to our politicians. I don't know if they, what I've found when you're talking about um, getting MPs to respond, uh, I don't know if legally they need to respond, but I found that if in your letter you ask for a response, you say, I'm really worried about that, please respond and tell me, what are you going to do about this? The vast majority of MPs actually do that. And that means that some staffer has read the letter, gone to their boss and said, boss, I've got another one of these letters about this issue. What do you want me to do? And the boss says, well, we've got to write a response, don't we? And even if they write the same response for 20 letters, They've done it, and they know they've done it. And next time they sit down and start thinking about their election, they're thinking, you know what, there was a lot of people who wrote to me about that. Maybe that's an issue I have to pay attention to. 
Matthew in Brisbane, thanks so much for a great contribution on today's conversation. one 800 316 to join in this conversation. Uh, just adding one more dimension here, because it's all very well to write. Uh, the thought mm. of arriving at your local MP's electorate office, uh, perhaps mm. with a delegation of leaders. I remember there was uh, somebody called in at some time back and said, uh, you know, I, I want to be a person who organises that delegation of leaders. And so we came to this sort of understanding that, you know, ordinary people who are not the church leaders in their town can still be the point person that can coordinate those religious leaders in town to form a delegation and go to the MPs. That's got to be another way we can see some teeth and some power for the church, haven't we? Extremely powerful. In fact, more powerful than letters is a bunch of people in his office and having a polite, well-reasoned discussion. And it so happens our website also has guides about how to have those meetings as well. Uh, find the contact details for your MP, a guide to thinking about structuring the meeting, who to bring, how to ask for it, even a suggested email to send to the MP at the start saying, hey, I'd I'd like to have this meeting. It is actually surprisingly easy to pull together a few people to go have a meeting with your MP, and it is powerful. Uh, You can bring stories, bring some people uh, who send their kids to the local Christian school and about how much they love the, the ethos that having Christian staff matters to them. Get them staring at their MP politely and just telling their stories. My daughter, this is what happened to my daughter when she moved to this Christian school. This is how she's blossomed because of the Christian ethos. Uh, These things are extraordinarily powerful. And it's stuff that we can do. We don't have to sit there waiting for an archbishop to do something. We as the people, as the people of God, as the Christians in the pews, we are the ones with the real power. Okay, freedomforfaith.org.au. I'll mention that as often as I can before the end of our Mm. conversation. And there's another website you mentioned, contactyourmp.org.au, and that's live for Queensland listeners uh, even now as we're talking about this issue. Let's take another Mm. call. Alex is in Melbourne. Hey, Alex, welcome. Uh, Hello there. Uh, Thanks very much, Neil. What are your thoughts? Uh, Yes, uh, it's okay. Well, we all have to uh, be accountable for our individual selves and before God and we'll be judged on our deeds but with the church changing the meaning of God's word from the head down I mean that's where the big problem is and then of course it's easy for someone to to uh, encourage them to go further and that's that's the problem when you hear uh, that you know, God's word is you don't know the meaning of what what a man is what a woman is and what what they're for and all this sort of thing it's, it's absolutely ridiculous but that's that's the problem alex you make a good point here because some of our major denominations are going to have some splinter groups that are somehow or other aligned with uh, saying yes to all of this denial of our religious freedoms and for all sorts of reasons uh, thoughts here mike for alex yeah and there's really nothing new about the fact that some denominations will have um threads that are um shall we call them theologically progressive uh, and don't take the, uh, the word of God as seriously as we ought to. But the churches who do take the Bible seriously are actually the ones that are growing, that are thriving, that have the numbers of people. And that, again, we go back to people means voters, voters mean power. And so it is the churches who are holding tight to the word of God who are the ones who have got the political impact. And I I know in some denominations, uh, particularly down in Victoria, it, it can be tough at times, but there are also a lot of really strong, really good churches down there. Uh, speaking in New South Wales, I think our churches, as a rule, tend to be a little bit more um, tight to uh, in some denominations, a little tighter to the Bible. And we have found that as we mobilise those people to talk to their MPs, to write to their MPs, to prove that they are voters and they are concerned, Our politicians have listened. Our Labour politicians have listened. Uh, And it's probably worth talking about uh, what we've done over the past 18 months in New South Wales to to convince churches to get engaged and to convince politicians to listen to us. I think there's some good lessons we can learn from that. Uh, Let me thank Alex for calling through and a good contribution. 1-800-316-316. Let's spend a few minutes talking about, um, you know, we we mentioned this just before the news, didn't we? 
uh, that somehow or other, people in New South Wales seem to have been able to cut through and be an influence on their local MPs around some of the legislation and uh, and there's some things maintained in New South Wales. So the simple question here, Mike, uh, what did people in New South Wales do that maybe all the states and territories can learn from, but especially right now as we talk about what's what's developing in Queensland? Yeah, absolutely. So 18 months ago in New South Wales, we were looking down the barrel of uh, just before the election, we had MPs all talking about we need to implement a conversion therapy legislation exactly the same as Victoria's, if not more strict. And so that that was a great concern. And what did we do? The churches got together, denominations got together and coordinated. And we said we need to speak to our politicians during this election. And the way we do that is candidate forums. In each electorate across New South Wales, we will try to have a church hold a candidate forum where we invite the Christians in the area to come in. We invite both candidates or all three or four candidates and some electorates, and we will ask them, what are you going to do about these issues that we're concerned about? We're concerned about religious freedom. We're concerned about poker machine reform. We're concerned about a number of things. What are you going to do about this? And by organizing it and doing and having a lot of them, though it happened in a third of the electorates in New South Wales, both parties sat up and took notice hey, these things are happening in our marginal seats. This is a lot of voters. We have to care. And the Labor, part, the Labor opposition, now government, uh, talked with us and made very specific commitments about conversion therapy saying, no, we are not going to copy Victoria's model. But this was just a case of the church using its natural strengths. Our organisation, we've got buildings, we're everywhere, we have lots of people. Hey, politicians, come talk to us. Come and hear from us and have the opportunity to make commitments about the things that we're worried about. That had a huge impact in New South Wales, and that set us up for the past 18 months. Because the second thing we did as a proposal came up, a proposal came up which, again, was just replicating Victoria, and we, we ran through the submission process and we put our submissions in and we saw our submissions get ignored by the bureaucracy, as we said before, we then decided we need to engage our politicians. So we wrote to them. Thousands of Christians and Muslims and Hindus and Jews wrote to their local MP saying, this legislation would be disastrous. You need to fix it. And you know what? The Labour government listened. The bill they get, but it is better than pretty much anything else in Australia because they listened, and that's because we on the ground decided to talk to our politicians. And, of course, uh, as you say, they listened, and uh, the legislation's not as bad, um, but even a bigger response may well have had an even better outcome. And so uh, yes. the response right now is in the lap of Queenslanders to do something about what's developing in the state of Queensland. And interestingly, if you don't have commitments from politicians before an election, you can't identify and hold them to account for broken promises after an election. That's the reason why I guess you've got to uh, eyeball your MP and get their response. Absolutely. I mean, at the federal level, the same thing happened. Anthony Albanese made a commitment before the election uh, to protect faith-based schools, and we have been holding him to that ever since, consistently reminding them of their promises. So at election time, we want to squeeze our MPs for promises. That is so important. And then throughout the rest of the year, throughout the um, the term of government, we want to write to them and say, what are you going to do? How are you going to protect our religious freedoms? Uh, Mike, come back to the church leaders for a few moments because we've got a great yes. context uh, where the teeth and the power are actually in the hands of the people. Uh, it's what the yes. people will do, not necessarily the leaders. But there must be some more things the leaders can do as well. Uh, just writing a letter. Yes. Uh, I mean, here's something extreme. Uh, what about the empowerment of leaders of churches um, to this word? And uh, this might even need some explanation and certainly needs lots of thinking. But there's a word that has been used in the history of the church Uh, when it comes to the uh, ways that church and state uh, are related and communicate, but leaders of the past have been able to use what we'd call excommunication. 
when you've got the political leaders who may well hold to a religious faith or love to stand outside the front of a church for a doorstop interview after church on Sunday, but then go something completely out of the way from what you think is a, a fair and, uh, and uh, quality understanding of theology, excommunication mm. has been a weapon uh, or a way of uh, exerting power. Is that in any way in any of the thinking of leaders that you talk to? I don't know if it's in the in the thinking of leaders that we talk to, but there is a real value in if there is a political leader who wants to hold to the name of Jesus and say and clearly say, I am a Christian, I, I am a believer, and then they are not living that out either in their personal life or their political life. I mean, we would do this with anybody. If there was somebody who's clearly saying, I'm a believer, and then they're not living it, we would be pulling them aside first quietly and saying, are you sure about that? Because the way you're living is not reflecting who you claim to be. Uh, and then if they consistently ignore the advice of their, of the ministers who are looking after them, that there is question about, in particularly in some denominations, whether they should be turning up to church on a Sunday. Uh, I think if there are politicians holding to the name of Christ who are rejecting the teaching of Christ, there is a, there is a hard conversation to be had. But it is the impo it's important that that's the role of their minister. They have got people who are over them. God has put over them in ministry responsibility. It's not my job to write to someone and say, well, you're not a Christian. You're not welcome in my church. But I think it is a very important responsibility of their church leaders in their denomination and their local church to be pulling them aside and mentoring them and discipling them and saying, well, if you are a Christian, maybe you should be thinking about this. And if you keep rejecting what we're saying, what do you believe really? When the church delegation turns up at the MP's office, uh, mm. do you think the MP puts their Christian hat on and says, of course, I am uh, you know, was born an Anglican or a Catholic, and of course I hold to all of the values that you're talking about. Thank you very much. Pat you on the back, out the door, and continue on an anti-Christian agenda. Do you think that happens? Oh, absolutely. And they do that when the environmental group walks in as well. Uh, politicians are really, really good at looking like they are one of you, uh, and agree with you, uh, and get you, and and make some non-specific promises and get you out the door. Yeah. A lot of politicians do that. There are a lot of good politicians too, though, who genuinely just want to hear what their electorate say, um, is concerned about. But by having the meeting, it's not really about just that one conversation and let's get them to make a promise there. You leave an impression when you're in that meeting. You leave an impression of a godly Christian group of people who are voters and are very concerned, and most importantly, 10 of you were in the meeting, but you represent three, four, five churches in the electorate, which could be hundreds, thousands of people who agree with you. In an electorate of a margin of 1.7%, that's, that's election winning or losing numbers. And right now, the power is in the hands of listeners to our conversation today. And I'll remind you that this conversation will be available on a podcast early this afternoon. There might be someone you can send it on to uh, that may well be encouraged or influenced by the sorts of things we're talking about. So many of those friends, family, contacts in our communities won't be aware uh, that this legislation is contemplated for the state of Queensland before the next state election that's coming in October. Uh, some significant things to talk about today. You know, on the issue of excommunication, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll spark a conversation around this, because this comes back to, uh, I imagine here, the leaders of denominations. I mean, who has the power to do that? Well, perhaps leaders of denominations. There is an element of church history here. Anyone wants to research this? Pope Gregory the Seventh and Henry the Fourth, eleventh century. Uh, Google that; uh, you'll find all sorts of uh, uh, YouTube clips, and you'll find the history and uh, worthy of research. But uh, this uh, contentious nature between church and state, uh, but certainly you'll discover in the Pope Gregory the Seventh and Henry the Fourth from the eleventh century, uh, you'll discover that the church did have teeth then, and perhaps there's teeth again today, but perhaps not without a whole lot of controversy that might go along with it. Hey, let's give those websites where you can find more detail about what we're talking about today. Freedomforfaith.org.au 
freedomforfaith.org.au. There's also another website, contactyourmp.org.au, and that site is live for Queenslanders who are contemplating doing something about the sorts of legislation that we are talking about today that's coming in Queensland. Mike Southon is Executive Director of Freedom for Faith, Mike, always great getting your insights. I want to thank you so much for sharing those with listeners today on 2020. It's been great. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.